Lord, we love you. Okay. Lord, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for this time, Jesus. We thank you for how great is your faithfulness, how great is your goodness, how great is your beauty, Lord. For no one could ever compare to you. Lord, we thank you for your presence tonight. We thank you for the privilege to bow our hearts to you in prayer, to seek you while you can still be found, to call upon you while you are still near. We thank you, Lord, that you're the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, that there is none like you, that you alone are worthy, you alone are holy, you alone are great and greatly to be praised. Lord, you're matchless in every way possible. And we say to you tonight, Lord, we welcome you in this place. You're welcome on your terms, Lord. And we say to you, Holy Spirit, you have freedom to move in our midst. We love you. We want you. We need you. We welcome you, Holy Spirit. And I ask that you will come in a greater measure tonight. I pray that there will be a greater increase of your presence upon each and every one who have partaken in this call tonight that you would grant us all a spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him by enlightening the eyes of our heart's understanding, that we would not only know the hope of the call that has been placed upon our lives, but that we would want to unite, arise, and engage in the battle that rages around us day in and day out against every breath we breathe and every, every prayer we speak. Would you come, Holy Spirit, I pray. Would you prepare our hearts, I pray, spirit, mind, and body. Would you give us a listening ear? Would you give us an understanding mind and a hearing heart? Would you calm all fears? Would you chase away all doubt, all busyness, and all distraction? Would you cause our eyes to look right on with fixed purpose and our gaze to be set straight before us, that we would know that the heat of his gaze will sustain us in these days that only appear to be getting darker before our very eyes. So we thank you, Jesus, for your mercies. We thank you for your love for us. We thank you, Lord, that you not only care, love us, but care about every detail of our lives, and you love us so much, Lord, that you don't want us to be troubled. You want us to be prepared. You want us to be armed. You want us to be fully equipped in full battle array. You want us to know how to labor with one hand. And you want us to wield our swords effectively in the other. We thank you that you're our commander in chief. We thank you that you're a man of war. We thank you that you are the one who established our steps and directs them according to your word. We pray, Lord, that you would do that tonight now. We pray that you would have your way in each and every heart. I pray for grace for us. I pray for strength. I pray for courage for us. I pray for wisdom. I pray for revelation. I pray for understanding. I pray for humility to come upon us. That we would be able to engage, Lord, in an intimate love relationship with you, knowing you're fighting for us and not against us, knowing that you're a God of redemption and restoration, knowing that you have a hope and a plan and a future for us here in Ireland, Lord, and in the nations, and it's to do us good, when we will become that people, Lord, who will have no other lovers besides you, who will humble ourselves, who will pray, who will seek your face, and who will turn from our wicked ways. Lord, we know we'll hear from heaven. We know you'll forgive our sins, and we know, Lord, that you'll heal our land. Lord, come tonight, we pray. Lord Jesus, come. Yeshua, come. We love you, Lord. We want you. We say again, you're welcome in this place. Give us the grace to yield. Give us the courage to, and the strength to take up our cross tonight, Lord, and follow you, Lamb of God, wherever you would want to lead us, I pray. Have your way in each and every heart, Lord Jesus, I pray. And unite us, I pray, Lord, in a spirit of true unity, Jesus, that we can be of one mind, one heart, one spirit, one purpose, one accord, that we have one agenda tonight, Lord, and it would be your agenda to see you high and lifted up, to be crowned king over the souls of each of our each of our hearts, over 
over the souls of each of our lives, Jesus, so that you could be crowned king over our nation and over the nations that you deserve, Lord. For, Lord, you are worthy, and the kingship and the kingdom are yours, and you alone are the ruler over the nations. We love you, Lord. We bless you. In your holy, precious name we pray. Amen. And so tonight, though, I want to share from another standpoint, and from the standpoint that I pray that will help us for our time of prayer, that we might be able to stand in the evil day, if that's okay with everyone. And if you've got your Bibles with you, if we can just read a few scriptures, if you'll turn to Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 13 are the ones I'm going to primarily read tonight. And um, again, that's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 through 13. And it says, Finally, brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Because we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of this world, and against spiritual wickedness in high places. Therefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Amen. First Peter 5.8 also tells us that we're to be sober, be, built, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. James 4, 7 tells us that we are to submit ourselves to God, which means to humble ourselves into his ways, and that we're to resist the devil and that he may flee. So I want to encourage us that the Lord expects us to be actively engaging in the battle that rages against us every breath, every day, and every breath we breathe. And so reality for those of us who said yes to the Lord and accepted Him as our Savior. We, we enlisted in His army without, um, there's, what's the right word? It's really not optional for us. It's optional how much we engage in it, but we're in it. And so we've got a real enemy that wants to destroy us. So if we're not engaging in the battle that rages against us, if we do not, we're not going to be able to stand in the evil day that's upon us. We'll be taken captive into the enemy's plans. And I've heard some, just share, um, I've heard some, I'd have to say dangerous would probably be an appropriate word. Uh, I say, I've heard some dangerous teachings out there that say we're not to take dominion and that we're not to subdue the evil. And I've also heard some out there say how there's these scary intercessors who are out there commanding things to be done on earth and how that if they're doing that, that they're going to get disciplined by God for doing so. And I just want to say that this is not what the Word of God teaches us. And it is doing a lot of damage to the remnant, causing many to be weak and passive in prayer. All the while, their lives and those around them and their nations are falling apart, quite honestly. And so what the Lord himself has to say about this is in Luke 10, 19, he says, Behold, I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. And nothing shall by any means hurt you. I'll say that again. I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy. He says all the power of the enemy. If the Lord says all, what does he mean all? He doesn't mean a little bit. He doesn't mean a portion of it. He said all the power of the enemy. Matthew 10, 1, he says, And when he had called his twelve disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Matthew 16, 19, he further says, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be 
will be loosed in heaven. So the Lord clearly wants us to take dominion over the evil that rages against us, trying to destroy our souls and trying to destroy our destinies, trying to destroy our families, our loved ones, our communities, our nations, our governments, on and on and on it goes. He not only wants us to, he expects us to. So how do we define dominion? And one way to define dominion, it, it, it means to be when in charge of something or rule over it. And I'll say that again. The definition of dominion is, is when in charge of something or rule over it. An example of that would be a king has dominion over his kingdom. So what do kings do? They take charge. They rule over their sphere of influence. They make declarations written and a declar they make declarations which are written or oral indi indications of a fact or belief. They make decrees, which is an edict or a proclamation issued by a person in authority. They declare, so they declare and they decree their authority over their subjects. That's just what kings do in the natural. So we can see there's some spiritual parallels for us to pay attention to. And Revelations 1, 5, 6 tells us from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sin in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his God and Father. So we are called to be kings and priests as a new creature in Christ, a new believer, a new creation in Christ. I don't know if creation is the right word. Cre um, an, our new man, our, the new DNA, when his seed was put within us, that was one of our earthly roles on this earth in this, to influence the spiritual realm to walk as kings and priests to his God and his Father. So we're to be kings, and what does that mean? We're to walk in the authority given to us over all the power of the enemy. And as Revelation says, where Jesus rules over all the kings on the earth. So the spirituals, Jesus is the head of the church. He rules over us, and under that, we're supposed to be all these many kings. Praise the Lord. That should bring you some hope and encouragement. Um, we're also supposed to be priests. And what does that mean? It means to, that is our role as an intercessor. And that means that's our role when we're standing in the gap before his throne of grace that we might obtain mercy, whether it's for ourselves, whether it's for our families, whether it's for a situation, whether it's for a nation, a gov it doesn't matter. When we're standing in that gap, we're standing in our, in our priestly role. And so Romans 8.37 tells us that we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. And some of us know that verse more as we're more than conquerors in Christ. And we hear that often in the body of Christ. And we're good at throwing these scriptures around. But how and what do they really mean to us? And so how do we define conquer? A conqueror is one who wins in war, subdues or subjugates a people or adversary. Now I'm going to read that definition again. First I'm going to read Romans 8, 37 again. It says that we are more than conquerors through him who loved him. So a conqueror is one who wins in war. We subdue. We subjugate a people or adversary. So we're supposed to be winning wars. We're supposed to be subduing our adversaries. That's what it means to be a conqueror and in him. So how much we conquer, though, or walk in our kingly role of authority or in our priestly role as an intercessor will be determined by how much we have been conformed to Christ's image, meaning into his character that you hear me so often talk about, meaning the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, humility, self-control. It's a kingdom principle. The more our character matches his in word, thought, and deed, the more authority we're going to walk on this earth. 
And so if we're not willing to, die, the only way to, to become conformed into his image is like this, if we're willing to deny ourselves, take up our cross and to fall only through the cross, only through a death of our flesh, can we be molded and shaped and formed and conformed that as we decrease, he can increase in us. And so if we're, if we're not willing though to, to die and to sit in the fire and become low and broken before him, not, to, not, not, broken and destroyed in the way that man has destroyed us, but broken over, broken before him over the things that break his heart. And it isn't always just, it isn't just our sin, but the sins of a, our family, the sins of a nation, the sins of the church, actually, to be quite honest. I'm very broken over what's happening in the body of Christ right now, and the compromise, the mixture, and the lack of godly leadership rising up to bring forth truth and correction where it's needed. But, but if we're not willing to, to sit in that place of refinement over and over, we're going to take unnecessary blows that we don't have to take because our character isn't going to match his, his character. And we see an example of this with the seven sons of Sceva that most of us are probably familiar with that. But... They were, they were seven sons of the high priest in the time, and they were, they were trying to cast out an evil spirit. But if it, if you remember the story, they took a terrible beating instead by that demon. And why was that? It was because these these seven sons of the high priest, they actually practiced, they actually practiced magic and they dabbled in the occult. And when they actually came to try to cast out that demon or that evil spirit, they, they said that they charged the demon to come out. And then what they said was, by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. It's a very interesting statement. Mm. By the Jesus whom Paul preaches. So the evil spirit spoke back to them. And, and for those who don't think they, they don't speak, we have to go by what the Word of God says, and it says, the Spirit spoke back, retorted back to them, and they said, Jesus I know, Paul I know about, but who are you? And they didn't, they didn't recognize any authority in, in, in these seven sons of the high priest. So they had, these seven sons, they had no authority over that evil spirit, and the demon knew it. Demons will bow to the Lord Jesus Christ authority alone. So the more we are molded and shaped and formed and conformed into his likeness, the more battles we're going to win. But demons, we need to know, they know when our character is compromised and, and when it's not like his. And because of it, we end up giving demons more authority over us than we actually have over them. And it's sad, but it's true. So it's why it's so important that we are decreasing, that we are becoming the fruit of the Spirit, that we can walk in true kingdom authority. And it's one of the reasons why a lot of people take beatings because they're out there naming it and claiming it, but they're not walking the talk and, and denying themselves and taking up the cross and following the Lamb wherever they may lead. They're not overcoming by the blood of the Lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they're not loving their life unto death. So, yet, I want to say, on the other side, though, even when we are denying ourselves, and we are taking up our cross and following the Lamb, we will still face warfare. And we see that with Paul and Silas, while on their way to a prayer meeting, they end up meeting a witch. And we see that in Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 40. And if you haven't read this, I encourage you to go read this. So I'm not going to read all the scriptures tonight for time's sake. I want to leave us some good time for prayer tonight. But I love these verses. I find great hope and encouragement in them. And I pray you will tonight as well, too. But after... After several days of Paul, in particular, being harassed by this slave girl who was possessed by a spirit of di divination, had a spirit of divination operating out of her, Paul was annoyed and worn, worn out, and he, he commanded, he, he took authority over that evil spirit, and he, and he charged that spirit of divination to come out of her. 
And so, note, I want to say, that Paul was not out of the will of God. If you read a few earlier in chapter 16, he was told a couple places where not to go, but in a, but he had a vision, and he was told to go to Macedonia. And Philippi, I believe, this, this was the tiny the village where this event took place as a part of Macedonia. So Paul was where he was supposed to be, doing what he was doing, and it was all while he was on his way to a prayer meeting. I hope you take encouragement this, friends. He ends up meeting a witch on the way to a prayer meeting, and this is where his battle began. And he got annoyed, but he also got really worn out. And so, and so, but at one point he finally took the authority and he said, enough, and he cast that spirit of divination out, spirit of witchcraft out of, the girl gets free, Paul's not out of the will of God, but instead he walked in the authority given to him, and because of it, that witch got, got saved, and she got set free. But not only Paul, but Silas was with them, they paid a high, they paid a high price for that, and warfare broke out against them. And so too it is like for us that we're not out of the will of God. We engage in the battle. The enemy hates it because captives are getting set free and there's retaliation that comes against us. And so that's a price of being in a battle. And it's why we want to be trusted in the full armor of God. And a lot of us are not, we barely have a, a part of the armor of God on, let alone the full armor of God. So. They faced severe retaliation, and it was because that witch's owner no longer profited from her witchcraft. So the enemy was raging. So too does it, you need to know, so too does the enemy rage every time we come against his evil schemes and the, and the power and authority in our kingly and priestly roles that we've been given. Every time, and, and just because we take some seems like setbacks or it's retaliation, it doesn't mean we did something wrong, and it doesn't mean that we or we're not supposed to be engaging in the battle and we were walking outside of our, the authority the Lord's given us. But the enemy hates it because it means decrease to his plans and it means increase to the Lamb of God's plans. So, so Paul and Silas, they were stripped naked. They were beaten with rods and they, were, they suffered many blows and they were then thrown into prisons with their, with their feet put in socks. I mean, how many of us have really suffered through that? Other than the persecuted church and the nations, the, the Western, Western nations, we don't really understand their sufferings. But I'm saying just to stand up for Christ, to stand up for the gospel, to stand up for what's right, just to come against the evil, cast out this and stand against it. How many of us have really suffered what Paul had gone through and what they had gone through? We, we, most of us couldn't say that. But they set a wonderful example and set a great hope of encouragement for us because keep in mind again, too, this all happened while they were just trying to get to a place of prayer. So it isn't just a prayer meeting, but as we try to come to that place of prayer in the morning, in the evening, how often is there's always a, often there's a, can be a battle against us, trying to stop us from entering and engaging in the battle. And then the battles are won or lost in a place of prayer. And you've heard me say that many times. And so keep in mind, that was where the first spiritual attack hit was on their way, trying to get to Lydia's house where there was a prayer meeting taking place. And so the spiritual attack came by this woman who was sounded good, praising Paul, but Paul had discernment and knew it was a spirit of divination, and he probably knew of her background and of the time they were in. But there was the attack that came. Then he went into warfare. Then there came retaliation because he defeated the enemy's schemes. And so the, the warfare and the retaliation brought them in prison. So, but be encouraged, though, beloveds, for if we endure in our sufferings his way, God will move mightily. And Paul and Silas, they didn't have a pity party when they were in prison. They didn't have, they were, now they were bleeding. They were bruised. They were battered. And they weren't having a pity party. What were they doing? They were in prison praying and singing. They are worshiping their God. And, and they're singing songs of worship. And because of it, breakthrough came. 
we need to remind ourselves worship is a mighty weapon of warfare against the enemy's schemes to destroy us. And it's often when we're so defeated and discouraged and down, it's the last thing we want to do. And why? Because it brings the breakthrough. The breakthrough to set us free to continue to engage, that we would fulfill our high and lofty destiny, but the breakthrough to bring other captives free. And we see that because Paul and Silas persisted in prayer and worship, a great shaking came. The prison doors and, and everyone, it says everyone's shackles fell off, causing everyone in that prison to be set free. And so why the attacks are so great, it's why the attacks are so great against us or they feel like they're so great because it's actually bringing freedom and setting captives free. There's the souls, the things that matter to the Lord, the things that the Lord cares so deeply about each and every one of us and why it's through that place of prayer, through worship, through intercession, but why um, to bring the bring the breakthrough that is needed. And so in that, as you read those scriptures, I love it and it's encouraging. The Holy Spirit moved mightily. He brought conviction and repentance to the prison guard and he was first going to run away and I think he was going to end up killing himself because he thought everybody's broken free and he's going to be, obviously, his life was as good as for nothing. But he ended up getting convicted. He was brought to repentance, we see, and not only was he saved, but his entire family was saved. This is, this is the battle that we're, we're against, and it's, it's worth fighting for. It's worth dying for. And the enemy, and if we don't, we're not only going to just wither up and not and die, not spiritually, emotionally, physically. We're not going to accomplish the Lord. But the spirit of influence the Lord has given us to be kings and priests over. We're not going to we're not going to accomplish what He wants to accomplish in us and through us. And so, um, because so Paul so Paul ended up. And Paul and Silas, at the end of those scriptures, they end up leaving the prison, and they were, and and they finally made it to Lydia's house, the place of prayer, place of freedom. So think about it. That's that's what they went through. All their intention was was just to go to this place of prayer, and on the way they end up getting into a, a spiritual war, got spiritually attacked. And that attack brought the warfare. The attack brought the retaliation. They ended up in prison. They ended up getting beaten up. They ended up in stocks. But they had the right heart posture. They knew who their God was. They didn't have a pity party. But they knew to worship. They, they kept in prayer and they kept worshiping God. And because of it, it, it caused everyone in that prison to be set free. And it included even the prison guard and his family to be, to be saved and set free. So... That's what we're contending with. And, beloveds, we have many evil spirits harassing us, as I'm sure most of you are, are intimately aware of. Uh, those You wouldn't be on this call tonight if you weren't a person of prayer. And with prayer, there goes retaliation. There goes warfare against us. And the enemy wants to defeat us. He wants to discourage us. He wants us to retract. He wants to whisper lies in our eyes and tells us all the reasons why we're... We're not supposed to be be doing what we're doing or not doing now. Um, and so, in this hour, though, we have we have many many spirits wanting to destroy us, many evil spirits harassing us, and wanting to destroy us as a people, as a tribe, as a tongue, and as our beloved Ireland, as our nation, as we see here. Um, and especially what's been happening with our government and what's rolling out, um, and in the nations, obviously. But our government specifically came out a few months ago, and they openly said that, uh, that we were to follow the spirit of the new rules, and that's the Antichrist spirit. And so we have the spirit of the new rules that wants to take us into captivity with fear, with confusion, with depression, many other things. But those are the main ones. And... The news coming out of our government in Israel is not good. And especially what we're seeing with the vaccine passport, which is becoming reality. It's been talked about 
for months and months, and especially Israel, you know, I've been keeping my eye on that, and they've come out with the Green Pass, and Netanyahu saying to go be vaccinated, accept the Green Pass, and start getting back to life. And he even went further and said, uh, whoever has the Green Pass can then go into gyms, cinemas, and soon restaurants and flights, and that, again, he was telling everybody to get vaccinated. And he said, in the end, the true green pass is the mask, the vaccine, and the card. And so that's where it's headed. Um, we're seeing that it's quite alarming. Tonight happens to be Purim. And there's a lot of uh, parallel spiritually with Israel. And what, what does happen in Israel does seem to follow into the nations. So it's concerning what we're seeing happening um, there, and as you hear me say so often, that that vaccine is a gateway to the mark of the beast and setting us up for the buying, or the no buying or selling, whichever, you, how you want to look at, um, you no know, buying and selling, unless you have the chip, and, and what that looks like, again, I'll be clear, I'm not saying the vaccine is the mark of the beast, it's not, but a gateway. And so we're seeing that unfold before our eyes even more. In Ireland, at the same time, which isn't helping, is one of two EU nations that have not opened the church doors. Slovenia is the only other EU nation. I believe Scotland also does not open their doors, but they're now technically considered, they're not a part of the EU anymore, being a part of the UK. And so, but Ireland though, of the two, Slovenia and Ireland, we have, for almost, I think the full 12 months since we've been in lockdown, we've never opened the church doors again. I think there's a little bit of a time where it was a, a small phrase, but we've, we're, the, we're the EU nation that has done it the longest. Our nation has more lockdown days than any other nation. And quite honestly, for no reason, we've never, you know, we've talked so many times, we never had a curve to flatten. Um, the plague of corruption is a lie. We don't even hear flu anymore. And all we hear is COVID, COVID, COVID. But I believe it's around 160 days, and I could be wrong on that, that we've been in lockdown, number of days since lockdown began, but the longest out of any other nation. So we don't hear about the flu anymore, but only the narrative that's being skewed by the stats that's only trying to bring us further into government control. Our businesses are being destroyed. All the while, the gar our guardi are locking up those who re reopen for reopening to survive, and there's a very courageous woman, Christine McTierney, I believe her name was, and she was arrested yesterday, but she finally opened her business, and praise God for her, and the, the guard quickly came, and they, they, they gave her the warning, and then she reopened, and then they came and they arrested her, and there was a few that protested, and I know there's others that are threatening in a good way to open their businesses too, but but this woman said it's for survival, you know, to put, to take care of her family, you know, and um, she did the right thing. But there's very few that are willing to follow her steps, but we praise God we're seeing that, but there's a lot happening. And our hospitals are full. I was talking to a dear precious sister recently, and I was really glad to have that conversation because I think it's going to be something that we pray about tonight too, is our hospitals are full of youth overdosing on drugs and alcohol. And my heart was just so grieved when I heard that. You know, unless we're a frontline worker or we're in the hospitals, we don't really see what's coming in and out. We hear it. We know the youth are suffering um, horrifically. I mean, our elderly are too, but everyone's suffering. But the mental health, without Jesus, there is no hope. I said that to one of the the um, shop attendants recently during the week when we were just talking about some of these things. And so, so at large, and, well, and the Lord is looking to us. He's looking to us as Ecclesia <laughs> to take authority over this evil that's destroying us. And so if anybody tells us we're not to have dominion, they're wrong. And now we're, I'm not preaching and teaching dominion theology I vehemently oppose that. That's not the same thing. But there's some teachings out there that say if we're not to command, 
in the name of Jesus and take authority that we're going to get disciplined by the Lord or we're going to get in trouble by God, that's, that's doing a lot of harm because if the Lord is looking to us to be the antidote and he's looking for us to engage in the battle and like Paul and Silas, we need to know as we engage in battle, we face, we take hits. We, the warfare can be intense at times. And so if we're not grounded in the word, grounded in, it, in the Lord Jesus, and, and really relationship is what is our anchor with him. Relationship is what weathers us through the storms, knowing we're secure in his love, secure in the plans, knowing all things work together for our good because why we love him. And though it's relationship that secures us in the storms and gives us the ability to keep going forward. But at large, most in the church are passive. They're waiting for someone else to do something, or many are not engaging because of wrong teachings that truly comfort our selfish, soulish desires. Most do not understand what it means to be a king and a priest in this end times army for these last days. Most do not understand the heart of God and that he will execute his righteousness on earth as they are in heaven through his ecclesia, his called out ones. That's us if we have a yes for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so most also are not closed as we started out with Ephesians 6, 10 through 13 and the full armor of God. Most do not have their loins belted, um, girded with truth. A lot of compromise and mixture. A lot of doctrines of demons. Um, a lot of false unity. I heard one of the most um, grievous things today that really threw me. <laughs> one of the things that I haven't heard in a really long time, but I was really grievous. And it was from a pastor, or supposed to be a pastor, and actually said that, um, that we're to have unity in faith, that we're not, that God didn't call us to have unity in doctrine. That nowhere does it say that we are to all believe in the same thing. And then they went on to list the different denominations. And I was just, really, when I read that. And that's here in our land. That that's going to weaken the body of Christ. That's the false unity unfolding before our very eyes. To say that we're to have unity in faith but not to have unity and doctrine, that's throwing out the whole Word of God. If you don't have the Bible and the Word of God, that is our doctrine. And it, the Lord said, His disciples, they had everything in common. They So, it's, that's just the belt of truth. Most don't have, if you don't have truth around you, that's your anchor. You're going to get tossed to and fro. You're going to get, you're going to end up on the wrong path real quickly. And so, and then if we don't have our feet shod with the good good news of the gospel, you know, that's that's that speaks of our preparation. It isn't a lot of take that as preaching the good news, bringing the, the good news to people. It can be that, but it's our shoes are what why do you need shoes? Because you you need to go somewhere. Preparation. And so we're to have our loins belted with the girded of truth, shot our feet with the good news of the gospel, we're to put on the breastplate of righteousness. How many are standing up for righteousness in this day as, as a filter for what we allow into our lives, into our homes, into our relationships, into our ministries, into our churches? And we're to take up, take up our shield of faith. Why? To quench the fiery flaming darts and arrows of the wicked one, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. So you can be assured the enemy roaring like a, like a lion to devour us, and he wants to first and foremost devour our faith. Because if we don't have faith, we can't please God. If we don't have those fiery arrow darts, will hit us and we'll fall flat on our face every time. So it's one reason I know the Lord wanted, he showed me in that dream almost a year ago, to pray for faith to rise in his bride's heart. Because without faith, we're not going to be able to, to, to withhold those fiery flaming darts and arrows that want to convince our mind, that want to say, did he really say that? You know, like Adam, or with Eve in the garden, and the serpent, did he really say that? You know, and all the ways we start to doubt and question. And so 
Um, we need to keep on the helmet of salvation. That's our thought life. Keep it pure. Keep it holy. No offenses. Philippians 4 a. Think upon whatever is so that's um, true, good, just. Whatsoever is pure. Whatsoever is a good report. Whatsoever is praise. You know, so we need to filter that through the Word of God, through the Scriptures. We need to keep the sword of the Spirit in our hand 24 hours a day, some days a week is how I pray. And with the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. See, so we've got to be rooted and grounded in the Word of God. So that is the full armor of God, and that's just a very small mini teaching on that. But how many in the body of Christ are dressing themselves in the full armor of God every day in all these different areas? How many are in bridal and war preparation? How many are willing to humble themselves Pray, seek his face, to seek him while he can still be found. And let him show everything, not only within us, but let him break our hearts for what his heart is breaking for. So because of it, because many are not fully full in the form of God, most are in compromise, most are in mixture, most are following doctrines of demons, most are exactly what came across my phone today, um, spreading lies that are hurting the body of Christ, that were to have unity in faith, but not unity in doctrine. And I know the Lord spoke to me about when I prayed, asked him about the false unity movement a few years ago, and, that, and troubled by that. And I remember I said, I was so troubled because hearing about people going to pray, and how do you pray with people, all these different opinions and, and perspectives and denominations and what they believe and don't believe. And the Lord told me, unity and truth. Truth has to be the anchor. Truth has to be our step, well, the rock we stand on. And everything else has to, has to come out of that. And so it isn't unity. Unity isn't we agree on that we, there is no unity because if we don't agree upon things, how is that unity? But we just get together. How can that be unity? And so it isn't unity. Um, there's no agreement in a lot of things. And so, um, but because of that, because we're not keeping ourselves in the full armor of God, we have many wounded warriors lying on the battlefield. And, we have many, and then we have others that are on the sidelines, sitting in fear and confusion, while many are being taken captive into the enemy camp. We've got a lot of our brethren that have been taken into the enemy camp these days. And it's one reason why we should want to engage in the battle, to fight for our brethren. Not to judge them, not to condemn them, but to fight for them, to be free from the lies, the deceit, the deception, the persuasive arguments, the, the, the whatever it is. The, there's so many that have been taken in captive. And the Lord wants us to fight for them. And they're worth fighting for. We're to fight for ourselves, first and foremost, to be free, but to fight the good fight of faith. And you cannot fight effectively if you're not in full battle right. You need your battle right. We've got to have it on us. And so, beloveds, we must be engaging in prayer, meaning in intercession. It is our only hope to be able to stand in the evil day. And I believe we're at the beginning of the evil day. And remember, remember Paul and Silas. Remember Acts chapter 16, verses 16 through 40. Go and read those verses. I encourage you. I believe maybe you'll see them a little differently, but I pray they encourage you. But... Remember, they faced attacks. They entered warfare. They suffered retaliation. But in that place of their suffering, they didn't give up. They didn't give in. They didn't give over to the enemy's counsel. They went into a place of prayer and, and worship. And because of it, it brought the breakthrough. And the breakthrough brought conviction. The conviction brought repentance. And it caused everybody to be set free. It brought freedom. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's a God of freedom is who we serve. And so there's um, wonderful, wonderful encouragement in the Word of God. So amen. So how do we pray tonight? Um, as, we, as I say so often, everything I share builds us up for that time of prayer. I pray and the Lord just is so strongly, um, I know we want to pray for the wounded warriors tonight. To become the warrior bride. There's a lot of our brethren, our brothers and our sisters, who are his remnant, who have a yes, who are beloved, who are lying on that, that battlefield wounded, that they can't even get up. 
And if they can't get up, how can we engage in the battle? And then we've got others that, are, that want to, but they're sitting on the sidelines in fear, in doubt, in unbelief, for whatever the reasons. And then we've got others that have been taken into captivity. So I believe, um, again, to pray for his, um, his remnant. But pray specifically for his the wounded warriors. And if we're if you're one of those tonight, we're praying for you tonight, because you are beloved, and he has a hope and a plan and a future for us, and it's to do us good. He sees our end, and he says it's very good, and he wants us to to be healthy. He wants us to be equipped. He wants us to be able. He wants us to be armed. And so, we'd want to pray though for those who may not understand the process of dying and denying themselves, taking the cross, that they would want to be conformed into his image so that we can walk in the true kingdom authority in our kingly and priestly roles that we are all called to walk in. And he expects us to, but again, it parallels to the degree that we've been conformed to Christ will be to the degree of the authority that we will be able to have over those over the demonic realm. And so... Pray for faith and courage and strength to rise in his bride's heart that she will labor with one hand, wielding her sword in the other, no longer being passive, sitting on the sidelines in fear and confusion. And pray for a great jailbreak to take place, for shackles of fear, oppression, and depression to come crashing off her mind, and for everyone in her sphere of influence, because we all have a sphere of influence. And, and so... That's prayer point number one. And then we're going to shift a little bit tonight, do something a little different, though. It's really on my heart to pray for our youth tonight, and especially to pray regarding the overdoses, the suicides mm -hmm. that are taking place in our land, the mental anguish. Most are, they don't have Jesus. They don't know the Lord. Without him, what do they have? And most, if they get out of the hospital, they just go out and drink again and do more drugs again. That's all, you know, They've been so shut up and shut down by the government. And so we want to take the authority that we've been given over this evil tonight, over our youth, and um, put flight to it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and pray against the spirit of overdose, the spirit of suicide, the spirit of oppression and depression, and obviously pray for the Lord to lighten our darkness. The Lord, meet them in that place, you know, um, and reveal his love to them and reveal his plans to them that the youth of Ireland will unite, arise, and build, that our youth will come forth mightily, because the Lord has a great plan for each and every one. And so, on that note, um, I'm going to say, can we set our hearts to pray? And